Welcome to tonight. I'm Bruce Whitfield. I'm in the Banana Jam Cafe. It's in the Cape Town suburb of Kenilworth, and I'm going to speak to South Africa's second biggest fan of craft beer. I've been the biggest, of course. I just don't know as much as Greg Casey does. He's a restauranter and he is the co owner of Bajan Banana Jam Cafe. I haven't even had a beer yet, and I'm already going Bajana Nam. Um, how many breweries have we got? Because you've got a sample of beers here, which we're going to try in just a moment. But they're what, 50, 60 microbreweries in South Africa? Right now, they're probably over 100. How has that happened so fast? It's just, it's, it's, it just happened. You know, three years ago, there were maybe five or six. And, uh, and now it's just, just grown. I mean, this is, goes back to the days of, I suppose, Lex Mitchell is the godfather um, from Mitchell's Brewery in Neisner of brewing. He, he's sold up there and he's gone to go and brew in Port Elizabeth. But that's the origin, I suppose, of craft beer in Southern. Yeah, I think look, it started with uh, Mitchell's Brewery. Um, there was Boston Brewery as well that started over 10 years ago. And uh, three or four years ago, Jack Black started. And that really sort of revived the craft beer industry. You know, it was a little bit stagnant. And when the marketing guys got in there and really started pushing craft beer and uh, people like Ann Union made it very cool to drink a beer that was more than 15 rand a pint, uh, that's where it all really started again. Because SAB Miller is dominant in this market, probably 85 to 90 percent of the beer that is sold in South Africa is probably SAB beer, the balance being um, Heineken, Amstel um, and then some craft beer as well. Are they allies? Are they adversaries? They tell us they welcome competition. They tell us that they support craft beer because it grows the category. Are they helpful? I think they are. You know, um, SAB has, uh, has helped me in my restaurant, and I have probably the biggest selection of uh, their competition, if you want to call it that, of craft beer in the country. We've got 30 different beers on tap. They have assisted in uh, many craft beer festivals by supporting them. Some people say they have their own agenda. Some people think uh, they're just doing it because they want to, like you said, grow the craft beer market. You know, spirits and wine are their real competition. So the more people turning to beer because it's been made more exciting by craft beer. You know, SAB doesn't do much more than lagers and pilsners. And, um, and yeah, you know, they've, they, they can now maybe piggyback off that and start as they are doing some new beers. So, yeah, I think... Uh, are they getting into the craft beer market in South they Africa? They are. Because, and they haven't told us this, because in the United States, for example, uh, they own something like Lincoln Flugel or something like that through, through the Miller-Coors relationship. In Australia, I think they bought a whole bunch of craft beers through the Foster's deal. So they are in the space worldwide. Oh, I mean, worldwide, they're definitely in the craft beer space. They own a lot of uh, microbreweries directly or indirectly through their purchases. Uh, they are interested in the craft beer market here. You know, Franson Street is going to start brewing. Where's Franson Street? Uh, that's in Joburg. They're, it's their small brewery in Johannesburg. They've, in the past, brewed. Uh, they do a, uh, an Oktoberfest, which will be coming up, I think, mid-November. They they do the Oktoberfest beers. They brew them there and bring them down to Cape Town. They've got one in Joburg, Cape Town, and Durban. Uh, they are starting to brew. They don't. They're not calling them craft beers because. The definition of craft, which is still a lot of people have different definitions. It's a bit like organic, um, free range, and all, that all of stuff, that. Yeah. And uh, so they they're doing small batches, and they and it's very it's there are a lot of people have got a lot to say about it. Some people think they where they're trying to hijack the craft beer market. Personally, you know, they make beer. They've made beer longer than most people. Uh, I don't think to say they <coughs> bless <Excuse> you. Me, <laughs> they, I don't think to say they don't have a, a right to brew a micro beer. As long as they don't, I, I believe as long as they don't try and disguise the fact on the bottle that it's not an SA or it's an SAB product, you know, and put SAB right at the back and try and make your consumer believe that they're purchasing a, a micro-brewed beer or a craft beer when they're actually brew, purchasing someone from SAB, I don't see a problem in it. You've got 30 on tap. I mean, and around the corner in the fridge, which we can't see here, but maybe we'll take a sneak peek later. You've got another probably 50 bottled beers as well. Some from America uh, and some from Europe. Some from Europe, some from America. Uh, I believe bringing beer from, I, I import a lot myself, uh, bringing beer into South Africa, not to flood the market with as many beers as you can, but America is 10, 15 years ahead of us in beer. Uh, the monks in Europe have been brewing beer for hundreds of years. They know what they're doing. And by bringing beers in like that, it gives the customer and even the brewer something new to try and maybe even a bit of inspiration. When you go to the United States and you have a Budweiser because that's the thing, first thing you do when you arrive, don't you? You have a Budweiser and you wonder why you've waited all this time. Uh, and then you've got a, a Miller Lite, for example. Bless them. 
um, there's a market for that sort of stuff. They then got the Blue Moon beers, the Samuel Adams, which are which are more interesting. And then there's a the craft beer market, which is growing there and it's influencing us. You've kindly poured a whole bunch of taste testers over here. I'm going to try this one, which is looks nice and light. I don't know what it is. It's a CBC Pilsner. CBC Cape Town. Cape brewery. Town, uh, Art and Paul. The the master brewer is Wolfgang. He used to brew for Palana in the waterfront, and he now is the master brewer there. Now, Palana no longer brewing under their Palana label. Palana no Africa. longer e even exists in South Africa. So all the Palana you get now is imported. I mean, that, that's a nice lunchtime beer. It's nice and Easy light. Easy drinking. Yeah. It's a great, uh, it's a great, we call it a crossover beer. You know, if, you, if you're used to drinking Castle Lager or Castle Light and Black Label, and you want to get into your craft beer market, you don't want to drink an IPA. IPA, you're India, looking at India Indian pale, pale ale. ale. It, it your socks Very bitter, yeah. seven, six, seven percent. Uh, a lot going on, quite fruity. So you don't jump from your lager to that. You're probably not going to like it. So you want to slowly get in there with something new. That's a gentle, gentle introduction gentle to craft introduction. beer. That this is, this uh, is looking a little bit more interesting. It's a little darker. Uh, it looks a little bit more flavoursome. Now that's when you say microbrewery. CBC can produce three thousand liters in one brew. This comes from Lakeside Brewery in Komiki. They produce about 300 liters of brew. So the difference there from micro to even call it nano, um, that's a small operation in doing small, really small batches. They do four, maybe five different beers. That's their red ale. Uh, you get it's, it, you it's, get it's it a lot dark, of different it's places. Toasty, it's toasty, it's rich. There's a lot of flavor yeah, really in good. there. Now we're sort of getting into more of the um, Real maybe beers. a higher grade of, of craft beer. Is anybody making money in craft beer in South Africa? Yes. You know, I think the small guys doing it on their own make enough money to, to get by uh, and they'll slowly grow. I believe um, brew pubs will be a good source of income where you can brew on premises and sell off on that premises. Now you're going to put a brew pub in. You're putting, you're a, putting a brew pub upstairs. This is going yes. to become a brew pub. You're putting a, a brewery upstairs. But the Firkin tried it probably 15 years ago. Others have tried brew pubs. Lex Mitchell's got a brew pub in Port Elizabeth. He seems to be doing well, but then, bless him, sorry Port Elizabeth. Um, there, there is a, there is you know, not too much to do in Port Elizabeth. He's bound to be successful. Yeah, well, you know, look, I'm not, I'm not relying on my brew pub to make this business survive. We've survived for 12 years without any craft beer at all. Uh, but for me, I have a passion for beer, so I'm putting a brew pub upstairs. Call it my man cave. Your man cave, excellent. You know, the, the wife is kicking me out uh, of the garage, so I have to go somewhere. I mean, we, 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 banana, banana moon, banana what? What will the brand uh, be? It'll be Afro-Caribbean Brewing Company. Afro-Caribbean? Which, it's, which is a, it's a, it'll be a totally separate business, but we're trying to keep in the line of, um, of, of our, our feel here. So. Uh, uh, coconut IPAs, mango pale ales, that type of thing. Very nice. Um, this one tastes a little bit like the stuff that my dentist gives me pumpkin when I... Pumpkin ale. See, pumpkin... Cinnamon, again, you know... I've got to try again, hold on. A little bit of cinnamon, a little bit of nutmeg. Yeah, but it's the stuff that I rinse my mouth out with at the dentist's, <laughs> isn't it? But that's, no, not, that, think, that's the cinnamon and nutmeg, I think. You've, you've, got to, you've got to be careful with the craft beer. You're not going to love everyone. You know, and I, a lot of people will will say, oh, that's not a good beer. And maybe it's just your taste. I don't like mushrooms. Yeah. But mushrooms aren't bad. Is so, there a mushroom beer? Not that I know of. Okay, good. Because they, they should keep it out a bit. There okay. are bacon chili beers, but um, I mean, I'm not sure about mushrooms. I, I, would, I wouldn't send it back. It's nice enough, but it's just, it's quite a, it's, the, the spices are quite strong in that it's, one. It's different. Mm. Uh, and what, what is number four? What number, number four, four is uh, CBC IPA. Now, this is the second CBC. This is the second CBC. Now, if you go from their Pilsner to their IPA, it's still a fairly easy drinking IPA. They haven't gone over the top with the hops. Uh, IPA, the bitterness. IPA is India Pale Indian Ale. Indian Pale Ale. And it was brewed in a particular way 200 years ago to make the trip to India. Hops and alcohol is a great preservative. So when we barreled our beer and sent it over to, uh, they sent it over to India from England unrefrigerated, it would turn by the time it got to India. So adding extra hops and, and bringing the alcohol up uh, secured that the beer that would, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't turn by the time it got to um, uh, got now to, that is yeah. deliciously bitter, um, and that is not even that bitter. No, um, there's one called Blockhouse, which I'm not sure if it's on. It's the, not on here today, but that Blockhouse is, is the most bitter thing that's ever been past these lips, <laughs> um, other than some vicious words once or twice. Um, but, but yeah, so CBC is certainly doing a nice variety. They're getting a nice broad, uh, a broad range of beers coming through. What's number five on your list? Number five is 
<laughs> as he pauses. Uh, so Make it up as you check, go. Um, check, check your notes spontaneously. That is that the made. Rogue 7-Hop seven, seven IPA. So no, now Rogue, Rogue is from Oregon, Portland, Oregon. In the United States. In the United States. They're one of the five godfather breweries in the States, which means they were really instrumental in the revival after Prohibition. Cool. I don't know what's so going on in there. Now they're, it's now very fruity, a lot more, a lot more bitterness. Um, still quite malt forward. But as you can see, even an IPA doesn't mean it's going to be exactly the same, the same all the way through. But it's an extraordinary combination, isn't it? But now, how do you get, because beer is best served fresh uh, once it's brewed. How does the rogue stuff get all the way from Portland, Oregon again, to South Africa in a state where it's absolutely perfect? Again, it's, uh, they use uh, something called key kegs, which is almost like a... A pup suck in a ball wrapped in a, a cardboard You're not going to sell the stuff if you tell people it comes in a pup suck. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, the, the same key gigs are used extensively in Europe and in France for wine. Mm, but that is delicious. And that is so, a level of complexity I've never had. Yeah, no, that's, um, that's very, very different. And again, you know, with the high alcohol and being an IPA, that it was designed to travel. Mm, no, so certainly, it and it's, travel it's, it's, well. it's, it's, got a, it's got a punch to it. Um, we get to number six. Finally, that is Brewdog, um, Brewdog Jackhammer from, from uh, Scotland. Okay. Uh, now, again, on the IPA field, we've gone from something like a 7% IPA right up to a 9.5% This IPA. is 9.5%. It looks so deceptively light. And um, it, you when, won't, when you it, it. actually, it is not that alcoholic when you taste it. A well-balanced beer between the high alcohol and the sweetness, you shouldn't taste a lot of alcohol. Just don't drive home. Do you have, do you have rooms? <laughs> I do you, don't. Because I, I do think <laughs> you should, you should you know, organize a room for us. Um, it's an extraordinary collection, but the locals, um, they're, not, they're not putting up a fight against the big guys. Um, the big guys are very high character, very, very punchy beers. A lot, Our yeah. guys tend to be a little on the lighter side? Um, we're, like I said, we're a little bit behind the states, so uh, we're still brewing stuff more for a... Um, a palate that hasn't quite come out of its shell yet. Uh, a lot of our guys will in South Africa will try an IPA and go, oh no, uh, my beer tastes like pineapples. Uh, exactly. that's, not, that's not a way a beer should taste. But again, from drinking um, lagers for most of our existence, we weren't, we weren't uh, exposed to beers like that. So we've got a lot to learn. We've got over 100 microbreweries. Over 100. I mean, we're expanding very, very rapidly. Inevitably, there must be consolidation. Uh, you know, Kalahari and uh, Take A Lot have merged. Um, it's a small market. Can we sustain 100 microbreweries in South Africa? Craft we beer can. breweries? We can. Again, a lot of these microbreweries, they're not the size of CBC. When you say microbrewery, it can be anything, like I said, from 300 litre brews to 3,000 litre brews at a time. So some guys will literally just brew for the, the town they're in or the area they're in. Uh, some people will brew like CBC Brews nationwide and even started exporting. Uh, so yeah, you, you, a, a suburb can support a brewery. Even, yeah, even like myself, we will brew probably 200 liters at a time. We won't even distribute. You will have to come here to get the beer. We, we're not doing it to sustain a massive industry. It's more of a hobby. It will make money. But uh, but it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be nationwide or, I or can't, global. I cannot wait until you add to the texture of the beers available. Greg Casey, nice to see you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. That's Greg Casey. He is the restaurateur behind, behind Banana Jam Cafe. Those were just some of his beers, of which had tiny sips. And it is really an interesting field. More than a hundred microbreweries in South Africa producing craft beer. Sab Miller getting on in the act in South Africa as well. Thanks for watching tonight. I'm going back to my beers. Why don't you go pour yourself one? Goodbye.